surfsupportcommunity.org. And the format of today's webinar will be as follows. Our speakers will be presented first, and then we'll move into our Q&A discussion. Thank you to those of you who submitted questions prior to the webinar as part of the registration form. Um, if you'd like to ask a question throughout this webinar, you can do so through the Q&A box, which is found on the right of your screen. At the end of this webinar, you'll be automatically redirected to our post-webinar survey. It's a short survey, and we greatly appreciate any feedback that you're able to give us. So I'd like to go over just some background on the cancer support community. We are an international nonprofit organization that provides social and emotional support to all people impacted by cancer. Um, the Wellness Community and Gilda's Club joined forces back in 2009 to form the Cancer Support Community, and through that merger, we now have over 50 affiliates across the country, as well as uh, satellite locations and online programs. The mission of the Cancer Support Community is to ensure that all people impacted by cancer are empowered by knowledge, strengthened by action, and sustained by community. This slide just lists some of the resources that we have available. So we have our Cancer Support Helpline, which is staffed by licensed clinical social workers who are available Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and they can help answer any questions that you may have and point you to valuable resources. We also have our Cancer Experience Registry, our Open to Options program, and our Frankly Speaking About Cancer program, all of which is available on our website. If you'd like to learn more about it or have any other questions, you can visit our website or call our helpline, which again is listed on the screen. So for today's discussion, we will talk about some of the coping uh, with metastatic cancer. We'll talk, we have a patient representative who will share his experience, and we also have a facilitator on the line who will be walking us through a mindful meditation session. So I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. We have Felice Apolinski, Dawson Wells, and Robert Wolf. Felice is a clinical social worker and has been the program director of Gilda's Club Nashville since August 1998. Felice was an active participant in the integration process merger of Gilda's Club worldwide and the wellness community to become the cancer support community. She cares deeply about the mission and is passionate about delivering quality and clinically rich programming. She considers herself privileged to work at Gilda's Club Nashville, which is an environment that provides and promotes a community of shared wisdom, support, non-judgmental acceptance, and deep respect. Dawson Wells is an MSSW candidate at the University of Tennessee College of Social Work and group facilitator at Gilda's Club Nashville. Dawson has been teaching mindfulness meditation for the last four years. For the past three years, he has been teaching a biweekly meditation course at Gilda's Club Nashville. Robert Wolf is a singer-songwriter living in Nashville, Tennessee since the mid-90s. His songs have been recorded domestically as well as in Germany, Canada, and as far as New Zealand. He has been married for 11 years. In 2012, on his 50th birthday, he received a formal diagnosis of bladder cancer. It was diagnosed as metastatic bladder cancer in the fall of 2013, and Robert will be sharing a little bit more about his experience later in today's presentation. Okay, so at this time, I would now like to turn the presentation over to Elise. Thanks, Rhea. Good evening, everybody. So you often hear those words, reduce my stress, and it's often a high priority on our to-do list, especially when impacted by cancer. But is reducing stress actually possible? It sounds great in theory, but how does one actually learn to do it? 
So tonight, this webinar um, will hopefully explore some stress reduction tips and techniques to help you feel more in control, to help you quiet your mind, and to help you manage the anxiety that comes along with the uncertainty of living with metastatic cancer. So this also is very important that folks on the line understand that this includes caregiver stress as well. Cancer doesn't just happen to a person, it impacts everyone who loves that person. And so in my presentation this evening, um, it will be, I'm hoping that I am speaking both to folks who are family and friends as well as to the person with the actual diagnosis of metastatic cancer. So what is stress exactly? Stress is a normal physical response to events that make you feel that make you feel threatened or upset your balance in some way. When you sense danger, whether it's real or imagined, the body's defenses kick into high gear and there's a rapid automatic process known as the fight or flight reaction or the stress response. The stress response is actually the body's way of protecting you. When it's working properly, it helps you stay focused, helps you maintain your energy and your alertness. In emergency situations, for example, stress can save your life. It can give you the extra strength to defend yourself, for example, or it can help you slam on your brakes to avoid, to avoid an accident, and that's actually a stress response. But beyond a certain point, stress actually stops being helpful, and it can start causing some major damage to your health, your mood, your productivity, your relationships and your quality of life. So the body's stress response starts with a signal from the part of your brain linked to your nervous system, which rules those involuntary body functions, such as breathing and blood pressure, heartbeat and digestion. So when you perceive a threat, your nervous system responds by releasing a flood of stress hormones and those include adrenaline and cortisol. These hormones rouse the body for emergency action. Your heart pounds faster, your muscles tighten, your blood pressure rises, your breath quickens, and your senses become sharper. So those are all physical changes um, that can occur when the stress response is initiated. Unfortunately, the body does a poor job of distinguishing between threatening experiences and minor daily stresses. So if you're stressed out over an argument with a friend or a traffic jam or a mountain of bills, your body can feel threatened even in those situations and can't really distinguish between the two. So when you re repeatedly experience the stress response in your day-to-day -day life, or in cases of trauma, you never fully return to a normal balance after a stressful situation, and that may cause you to start having some serious health problems. So your stress can negatively impact you in all of the areas of your life, physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral. So some examples of that include your cognitive Function can change with stress, with memory problems, or the inability to concentrate, poor judgment, anxious or racing thoughts, or that sense of constant worry. Stress can negatively impact you emotionally by creating a sense of moodiness, irritability or short-temperedness agitation or inability to relax, that sense of feeling overwhelmed. It also can seem to cause loneliness and isolation, general unhappiness, and sometimes depression. The physical symptoms that stress can impact, it can create aches and pains, diarrhea or constipation, nausea, dizziness, 
chest pain, rapid heartbeat, a loss of sexual drive, and the like. As far as behavioral symptoms, what does that impact look like? For some people, it's eating more or less, sleeping too much or too little, isolating yourself from others, procrastinating or neglecting responsibility, using alcohol or cigarettes or drugs to relax, or perhaps an increase of nervous habits like nail biting or pacing. So long term, these things can really become, they can move from stress to distress. And that can create an awful lot of problems. And so tonight, the idea is to figure out what is stress, how does it react in your body, what triggers that response, and what are some things that you can do to manage that. So should I stress about reducing my stress? You know, that's kind of the circular question, right? Um, the idea is that you'll learn some techniques and you'll try them and you'll find different things work for different people. Um, I would remind you and will remind you again in this webinar, as I'm sure Rob and Dawson will as well, that stress reduction techniques are in fact a practice. It's not something that's a one and done kind of an, an, uh, an experience. You really have to try something, try it again, and try it a third time before you know whether it's something that's going to really help you reduce that distress. So how do I reduce my stress? My suggestion is that you create a stress management plan. Identify what stresses you. Identify how you typically respond when you're stressed. Identify how you want to respond. Develop a plan of things to try. Do, you know, practice several different of the techniques that I will talk to you about. And then find the ones that work and modify your plan as necessary. And how will that benefit you? In numerous ways. It should improve the quality of your life. It should increase your energy level and hopefully help you sleep better. It may improve your digestion and increase your focus and productivity. So, Tips, tools, and stress management techniques, and there are pages and pages and pages of these. So I'll just go through some of them. Um, many people find that exercise and movement is very helpful, and when you are impacted by metastatic cancer, you've got you know, different abilities and different energy levels at different times of your day or perhaps different times of your treatment cycles. And so exercise doesn't mean getting up and running a marathon. Sometimes it means standing while you brush your teeth or walking back and forth to get your newspaper out of your driveway. And perhaps one day you get to the end of your driveway and a week or so later, you get to the end of your block, and a week or so later, you go a little further. So, you know, exercise really means at, at your pace and as gentle as you need it to be. Movement goes along with exercise. So you can, you know, you don't have to do yoga and necessarily tie yourself into a pretzel and stay there for 30 minutes. For some people, yoga is very, very helpful. For other people, the bending and twisting of yoga can be really difficult. And so movement can be as gentle as picking up a couple of water bottles and doing a bicep curl or holding a canned good and moving it over your head a couple of times or using an elastic band and tying it in a circle 
and putting your feet inside and moving them around a little bit. So it can be as much or as little movement as your body and your energy allow. Another technique is some dedicated stress time. What that means is give yourself the opportunity to worry for a certain amount of time every day. Some people use what's called a worry box where you take a sheet of paper and you write down everything that's worrying you and you tear it into little strips and stick it in a box. And every day you take that box out and you give yourself 15 minutes to move through those pieces of paper and really sit there and think and worry about those things. And then you put them back in the box. You put the box back on the shelf and you go on about your day. And as silly as that may sound to some people, there are folks that have really found enormous benefit of just allowing themselves the opportunity to really dedicate some worry time, and then it lightens the load for the rest of the day. Another technique is allowing yourself some breaks and distractions. What do you enjoy? What brings a smile to your face? What distracts you from the distress of living with the uncertainty that metastatic cancer can bring? Is it being out in nature? Is it watching a baby laugh? Is it allowing some puppies to climb all over you? It's different for everyone. Is it some really awful reality television that just takes your brain and distracts it for a while? Whatever those breaks and distractions are can be an enormous, helpful stress management technique. Spirituality is helpful for some. There are many people that find great calm and centeredness in their spirituality or faith community. If that's something that works for you, I would encourage you to connect in that way. Laughter and humor. We, I'm from Gilda's Club Nashville, and so part of Gilda's Club is that the muse for us is, is Gilda Radner who was on Saturday Night Live and back in the days when that show was actually entertaining. And Gilda was hysterically funny. And so there's a lot of laughter that goes on here at our organization. Um, there's a lot of playing with your pain. Um, and sometimes you can laugh about things that other people just wouldn't necessarily find funny. But to have a really good belly laugh is internal exercise, and it's a wonderful stress reduction technique. So find those things that make you laugh, old Carol Burnett reruns or silly cat YouTube videos or, um, you know, playing a harmless practical joke on your spouse. Whatever makes you chuckle, enjoy, and, you know, employ that. Yoga, as I mentioned before, and other mind-body mind techniques. There are, gosh, just a million of them that are really very popular right now. Um, there are lots of different kinds of yoga, from gentle and relaxation yoga to hot yoga. There's also things like qigong and tai chi and guided imagery and relaxation. Mindful meditation, which is something that Dawson is going to speak about in more detail. So find, you know, find some management, some stress management tips and tools and give them a try. They're, they're things that are free and easy and really accessible, like breathing. When you are stressed, when you are living either in your own uncertainty about your own health or you are loving somebody and worried about the, the, their health, you may find that your breathing is very shallow. And if you can close your eyes and give yourself a few minutes of really deep inhale and exhale, where you're breathing from your belly instead of your chest, and for some people, actually putting their hand, one hand on their belly and the other hand on their chest, and breathing in 
and allowing that belly hand to move and holding that breath for a moment and then slowly exhaling and allowing that belly hand to move. Doing that a few times, several times a day, can be incredibly relaxing and stress-reducing. Progressive muscle relaxation is another technique, and it's one that you should really probably get your your healthcare team's approval about. For some people, um, it would it, it could potentially be more uncomfortable than helpful. But that technique involves kind of squeezing and releasing your muscles from your toes up to your head and back down to your toes, where you're really restricting your muscles and then allowing them to release and deeply relax. And oftentimes it can bring deep, gratifying relaxation. Counseling is another really wonderful tool for a lot of people. Finding a good psychotherapist who you can kind of unpack your baggage with, your emotional baggage of what it's like living with distress and stress and uncertainty, having someone from outside of your family that you can just kind of tease through all of those things with and learn some coping skills and techniques. Um, learn how to communicate well with your family and with your healthcare team. Those kinds of things can really help reduce stress. Um, there are counselors in most areas that work on a sliding scale fee. There are a lot of cancer centers now that are offering counseling. And so individual counseling can be, or couples counseling, can be a wonderful tool as is a support group. If you can find a wonderful support group in your area where you are connecting with other people who are living with metastatic cancer or connecting with other friends and family who are loving people living with metastatic cancer, not only will that break through the isolation and help you feel less alone, it's also a wonderful way to share wisdom and support and get some suggestions and learn what's working for some folks so you could give that a try and they in turn will learn from you. And so in my almost 18 years of experience here at Goldus Club, the support groups have been an incredible tool for people in terms of stress management. Hypnosis is another. Some people find doing some expressive arts or some journaling and writing can also be wonderful stress reduction tools. Talking to friends, helping other people, sometimes getting out of yourself or being with folks with other people whose problems are kind of quote unquote worse than yours um, can sometimes provide just a little bit of lightness and a little bit of perspective and can get you out of your own self for a little bit and can help kind of balance some, some of that stress and distress. For some people, listening to music is a great stress reducer. So, you know, I've listed about 27,000 kinds of tools and there's no time to go deeply into all of them. But in this day and age with our technology, there are lots of free apps and websites and YouTube videos and DVDs and iTunes downloads and I'm sure other things that I'm too old to even know about where you can try some of these techniques out for free. Try a Qigong YouTube video or a Tai Chi YouTube video and just give it a shot. And, you know, what have you got to lose but a little bit of time? And it may be that it helps you relax a little bit and helps you find a center and helps you lessen the chaos and the distress and help you feel more in control, which is really key when living with the uncertainty of metastatic disease. So when is it that 
distress gets to a point where you really need to think outside of these stress reduction techniques and get some professional help. Um, you know, one of the things I didn't mention as a stress reduction tool, which can be really helpful um, for some people, is medication. There are many people that really respond well to a short-term anti-anxiety medication when techniques are simply not enough, when your daily life is being impacted by your stress and distress. And so how do you know when that is? Are you experiencing a decline in your performance, whether you're a student or you're a working person or you're a stay-at-home parent? Are you finding that you're unable to cope with the demands of daily life? Are you obsessing and totally preoccupied by fear so that it really robs your joy? Are, you, are there significant changes in your sleeping and your eating habits? Are you misusing substances or being self-destructive in in other ways, if any of those answers are yes, if you are withdrawing and isolating, or if you have suicidal thoughts or any urges to hurt yourself or others, then absolutely it is time to raise the white flag and reach for help. And there is no shame in discussing those things with your healthcare professionals. They will, it's not unusual to experience anxiety and distress when cancer is in your world. It's more unusual not to experience those things, but when they become overwhelming to the point of your emotions are in control of you rather than you feeling like you can control them, then it is time to reach for help. Talk to your healthcare professionals, call 911, go to your nearest emergency room, or call your local crisis hotline. So it's probably not a bad idea to have that local crisis hotline number pasted on your phone or in your cell phone so that if at 3 a.m. when those stress goblins hit and you start to feel preoccupied by those, that you've got the number handy to reach for to keep yourself safe. So, create your own personal stress management plan. Figure out, list for yourselves what, what's stressing you. Then list how you typically are responding. What are your moods? What's your behavior? What's your physical symptoms of those stressors? Then identify one, two, or three of these techniques that I've listed and give them a try. Develop a plan, practice, 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 and modify the plan as needed. So I would suggest that you schedule a few minutes of practice every single day if possible. And, you know, be realistic. There, not everything's going to work for everyone, and there are going to be days that things work better for you than others. And so, you know, don't beat yourself up. Just try something new. Try it more than once. Perhaps try it a third time. And then ditch it and try something else. There are so many choices that there, you will find what works for you. So thank you so much for your attention. I am going to hand the webinar over to Rob, who is going to share some of his personal experience. Thank you. Thank you, Felice, very much. Hello, everybody. I'll tell you, as uh, Felice was speaking, I think I, I was taking some notes myself, and I can't wait to review the webinar. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, it's great to be here with you, and I uh, speaking here from uh, Gilda's Club Nashville. And I, uh, I just think it was a great day when I came here and reached out to the Gilda's Club Nashville organization and 
ultimately with the cancer support community uh, community here because uh, it's just uh, been a tremendous relief and a tremendous blessing for me. Um, it basically has been uh, been a lifesaver for me. There's uh, so many people working in the medical community, of course, with with my metastatic bladder cancer diagnosis. I'm, you know, I have a part-time job and what sometimes feels like a full-time job as it relates to uh, trying to combat what I've got, discover what I've got, what I what I continue to have with complications and so on. But uh, I was in the middle of that back in, I would say, the beginning of 2014 after my metastatic diagnosis. And uh, it was around February of last year, and I came in and I met I met with Felice. I made the call to Gilda's Club Nashville, saw that red door right here on Nashville's Music Row, and and uh, we just had that um, initiation meeting, really, and and um, and then just through uh, through that connection with her and and the organization here, got just got connected with so many people, and and I think Felice must have had that list branded in her mind and listened to me and sent me in so many different places and, I, and I've taken advantage of, of so many of those things that she's recommended them and and sharing some of them with you today um, is just a, a real pleasure. Um, I would say that that uh, it's, it has been a dramatic help and I am confident that it will continue to be uh, just coming here uh, and working with what has um, really what has become all of these recommendations and what continue to be, and it just grows in the network of friends and and experiences and knowledge grows. And uh, as she mentioned, you just you you kind of you expect do some experimenting and you find out what what works for you. And I did I, I believe I've found so many um, so many items and so many. Uh, techniques and such to to manage this stress and to cope with this metastatic diagnosis and the, and the related issues and complications. Uh, but I would say that that one of the one of the things, and I think it's a big one, and is is the staying in touch with positive people and media. And that is. You uh, you have an opportunity. One of one of the stress reduction areas that is available to us, and that's one I've taken care of, and I I still work on it, but I continue to um, continue to work at this is to find those people. If there is if there is a negative vibe coming from a person, and I don't absolutely have to be with them, if I have a chance to. Go ahead and say, okay, I'm going to start saying no with you, no to you at this point, and and just jettison that uh, that negative energy and and that negative attitude from people, if at all possible to do it. That's great, and there's ultimately um, ultimately some assertiveness training that may work <laughs> to help with that. Uh, maybe you can turn that negative into a positive somehow, and and those people, and hopefully breathing and further understanding with them can be helpful, but also just those positive people, I think intuitively you know who they are. And those are the people that are going to help you, that are going to support you, that are that are not going to have an ulterior motive, that are just loving. And I think you I think you can identify that. Uh and and hope you will. And I I, I believe in my life that I have. And just by by being receptive, by being open to positive people with whatever it might be, spirituality and some of the things that we'll be discussing in a, a short while, but with with the uh, meditation and so on, that you ultimately can, can stay in touch with that and welcome it. Uh, when I, <clears throat> when I uh, you know, came through with, uh, with this diagnosis and in here I have uh, right around the time I knew that I had positive people, it was before, say, this <laughs> potentially the metastatic diagnosis came. I definitely had an approach of attempting to to, to be near positive people. It's just an overall life uh, 
uh, stress reduction technique, but uh, one of the things that I think ultimately helped with it and just helps further are <clears throat> uh, this daily practice of gratitude upon awakening and transcend transcendental meditation for, for me. There's been some mindfulness, and obviously mindfulness medi meditation is coming up uh, very soon, but uh, this daily practice, and that's one thing I love that Felice said, was not one and done, but daily. That's that's very powerful. Uh, but, but one of the things I've done in, in my experience is to have that practice of gratitude, and I, every day, without exception, and it has been for, and now I can't remember when I haven't done it, and that is to say thanks when I wake up. There are some, I say thanks when I go to bed, and I say thanks when I wake up, and those are probably some, you might check around if you take a good listen to people who are talking about spirituality and a positive attitude, uh, there's altitude, and at, attitude of uh, gratitude is altitude, and some kind of variations of that. Uh, upon awakening, I, I say my thanks, and I, I remain uh, grateful, and uh, um, and just and I, and I pray that, uh, and and just concentrate on on hoping that whatever's brought to me that day and in the morning and whatever that I will have power to cope with it, and I'll have the positive people to help me cope with it, uh, and um, and the, really the strength to do that. And uh, that's uh, that gratitude to me, I start that off. That's job number one. That is, that is moment number one when, I, when I'm up. And the, at this point, the, uh, uh, the transcendental meditation, that is something that I have um, that I have that I began a little over a year ago, very close to the time that I joined Gilda's Club. I had an opportunity to uh, go to Nashville's Transcendental Meditation Center, and uh, I just uh, took the Transcendental Meditation course, and it's uh, it's available, and you can find out about it at tm.org. But I I had a stipend for it, and actually a a scholarship for it from the David Lynch Foundation. Uh, that reached out and, and had made that available to me with my cancer diagnosis. Uh, but I learned this technique from certified teachers, and I have been practicing that every day um, since. And it is, uh, I would say it has reduced my stress dramatically. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, just a wonderful technique that uh, has... Uh, Proven benefits in terms of uh, reduced uh, again reduced stress, but even heart rate, blood pressure, just coping capability. And, and many many studies have been done, about 600 of them. And uh, I've I've just uh, experienced joy with it, and uh, will definitely continue to do so. It's been indispensable in my journey here, uh, and in my ability to cope with. Uh, the metastatic diagnosis. And now, when when I came into Gilda's Club, I, th I think I've certainly heard about the support groups that have that have happened. But we we uh, we took advantage uh, of the support groups that have been made available here. And actually, as soon as I'm done here, I'll be running into a support group, <laughs> the survivors, metastatic survivors support group. Uh, but uh, I came in, just a, a spot was made available for me. I joined uh, I joined it and uh, have been, um, have uh, been going every week. Uh, and it has uh, been indispensable. I've, I've made uh, just some or some great friendships in the groups uh, and in the specific group that I've belonged to. And the, the at the club here, it's just been fabulous. And actually, my wife, my wife Lori, has joined a uh, has joined a, um, a family and friends support group as well. Um, so she, uh, we, she as well has um, managed to get some major stress reduction out of this. Uh, and in addition, we have um, we have really had some 
wonderful time together coming coming in. We get to she runs in from work and we actually have it simultaneously. We can't I can't give her a lift to it, but uh I have uh I have just enjoyed seeing her and we'll run out at the end of the evening. But it's been wonderful to have that have that time. Uh in addition now what what uh one other thing that uh that I've been able to use to ease stress is the practice of qigong and tai chi uh as well as something called li and gong there so happens to be a a wonderful free class at the center here uh but I've actually over the years I've actually studied a form of qigong called li and gong uh had it a number of times and I have been able to memorize the uh moves uh so it's uh it's it's been wonderful to just almost take that moving it's, it's somewhat like a moving form of meditation and to and and to have actually uh a beautiful sense of well-being physically when you when you uh run through the motions of tai chi and go to a class and you actually potentially can have some some people to bond with at uh, those classes so i have i have just experienced um uh, a, a major relief and uh you know again that major sense of well-being and to experience that what i call that chi and we there's a little chi ball a little ball of energy i i find that's associated with it so that's uh fantastic um, and one other thing uh, the the uh what I've done is even therapeutic massage. I don't know if I heard Felice mention that, but uh, through an integrative center here, I've had the chance to get that therapeutic massage, and it happens to be uh, you can actually deduct it from your HSA account. So um, I thought, why not? We ha- we had the opportunity to do that, and and I've definitely taken it. I think I have an appointment next week, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, psychological counseling that is one thing i have certainly taken uh taken advantage of uh through recommendations here and i just continue to do that and it has it has helped such a great deal and i almost sense i almost sense when i need it and i i use that intuition overall and that's really what came um what came down um as far as uh, uh as far as my moving uh, you know, my moving toward Gilda's Club and so on is just having a feeling that I am pushing that stress level is that stress level is really heating up. I <laughs> I need to reach out. So I I know I still feel that stress with the with the meditation, with mindfulness, with exercise, you name it. I I do feel that stress. And uh, I, I just uh, I I feel there's I feel there's a net of some kind with the positive people with psychological counseling potentially with uh, drugs anxiety drugs should I need them and um, and drugs to help me sleep when I need it I uh, I'm trying to drop my pride and say look I've got to do this it's just it just has to happen we're I'm a, I'm a human and um, and I need all the help I can get, and it is it is available. Uh, so I'm I'm all for it. <laughs> uh, so uh, yes, psychological counseling definitely a uh, uh, a great opportunity there. Uh, there's one other one other item as well as uh, I've, that I've had over the years, and it so happened to uh, be a part of my be a part of my journey and uh, no pun intended is bicycle riding. Uh, so, so one of the most positive people in my life, my friend, my buddy, Chris Bergsness, he, uh, he uh, was doing some bike riding and he turned me on to it. And we, uh, I got a mountain bike and all of a sudden felt like I was about six years old, seven years old, getting, getting that big old bike and running around hills and, Doing some, one of my first trips was like mountain type biking on, on some gravel uh, a little bit west of Nashville in an area called Ashland City. Beautiful, uh, beautiful paths out there. Uh, 
uh, and uh, it is it has just been uh, terrific to get involved in that. And I mean, some, sometimes, and actually lately for me, it's been a little more difficult to to get into that. I've been a little more challenged in terms of in terms of strength. So something gentler like Tai Chi and Lian Gong is uh, is definitely a possible is possible and feel like better alternatives for me at the moment. And if it so happens that today is not the day I go out bicycle riding, that's okay. If it so happens I just need to stay in and do a few Lian Gong moves and um, do something called sinking the chi, a couple of those exercises, uh, I've done I've done well. And I and I would say Recently, in my experience, uh, overdoing it has been a problem, and I honestly, I overdid it last week, and I'm paying for it. <laughs> I've been paying for it for a few days, so uh, that's that's honestly that's something to really watch out for. Uh, your effort to reduce stress can sometimes lead to a little extra. So 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 pay attention. You know if there's you know, when people say stay out of the sun, you know, stay out of the heat, drink plenty of water, some of that basic advice can can be very helpful. And I'm thankful that that uh, however I've overdone it, I feel um, I feel things are under control at this point. But it but those things are, are risky, and and you can uh, so so just watch out. But yes, get that moderation. <laughs> moderation is good. Uh, the one thing that uh, that my wife Lori and I get involved with are our favorite shows, and uh, that's that's a been a great stress reducer for us, for both of us, and it's been um, you know in terms of coping with the metastatic cancer, this has been uh, amazing. I, my personal my personal favorite show is Key and Peel. They're a comedy duo, and they have. Um, uh, they just have a show on Comedy Central, and it so happens that Lori and I can't get enough of their program. Uh, there are others out there, of course, but uh, you know that's a central one, and uh, it's um, it has. I could feel the stress. You know, for for us, it's laugh so much you cry, uh, and that's uh, that's unbeatable as far as I'm concerned uh, to to be able to experience that. You know, as a uh, as a singer songwriter uh you know i've one of the things i've done in the songs that i've written i've i've tried to keep laughter in the mix i definitely enjoy writing funny songs and i enjoy playing with words i believe that can be helpful to uh to just you know look for something that'll that'll bring a smile to you or somebody else and it helps to have somebody i know in my experience it helps to have somebody that um will laugh at the horribly flat joke that um that I just offered. Uh, <laughs> so Lori is 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 pretty amazing. <laughs> She's pretty amazing in that regard. Uh so that uh that pretty close to wraps up the time that uh that I've had and I it's been an honor to share with everybody what uh what um what I what I can about my experience coping with metastatic cancer and uh, you know I will continue to use these tools and I know on a daily basis they're going to be a part of be a part of my life and um, I hope uh, I hope you will have a look at what these are and find your own and do that experimentation that you can and I am uh, I am definitely looking forward to uh, to Dawson's presentation on on uh, mindful meditation so just um just just hang on for Dawson will be right here and uh, thank you all so much uh hello um thanks uh thanks to rob and uh thanks to everyone for participating and those that have um put this on um, we're gonna try actually a little mindfulness meditation uh exercise in just a minute um 
But before we do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, mindful meditation, specifically um, as it applies to times of stress. Uh, a lot of times when people come to me um, and they're um, in uh, a very stressful situation, a lot of life change, um, a lot of new, a lot of overwhelming thoughts and feelings, um, they're, they're hoping that I'm going to teach them a technique that's actually just going to wipe their mind of thoughts um, so that they can just get a break and just sit in silence. Um, they're just experiencing so many overwhelming things um, from the whirlwind that can sometimes come um, and surprise us uh, that they just want that, um, that relief. And, uh, of course, certainly uh, allowing ourselves 15 or 20 minutes to just sit and be still um, can be a very powerful uh, relaxation and very helpful. Um, however, the greater gift of mindfulness meditation uh, is that it's the practice of, of learning to be with our thoughts and emotions and allowing them to be as they are and expanding our awareness of what they are and what else can be present in the moment. Um, we all know that life is not without stress. Uh, I don't think any of us, um, if asked, would say that we expected a life totally free of stress. Um, but when stress comes up, we, also, we, we, we often kind of think that um, happiness can only be um, if, we're, if everything is light and easy um, and um, free and open. Um, and what we kind of do when we come to stressful situations is we actually we, we, try, we try and push away um, any of the emotions that we consider negative, and we try and push away the stress. Um, and we spend a lot of time um, fighting our situation um, and second-guessing ourselves saying things like, um, I should be stronger, or I shouldn't be so affected by this. Um, and what we sometimes realize a little bit too late is that approach uh, can add actually a lot of suffering to the anxiety that we're already experiencing. Um, so when we come to meditation, uh, instead of adding extra suffering to our anxieties, uh, by trying to fight off our thoughts and feelings, uh, we instead allow ourselves to sit with our thoughts and emotions uh, without judgment, uh, without trying to judge them as good or bad, just allowing them to be there and to kind of play out on their own, uh, just watching them and observing and seeing uh, if we can come to understand them a little deeper and if we can kind of see what else is present. Um, just to offer uh, a personal example that I, I use a lot in my classes, uh, and it seems to resonate a lot. Um, a few years ago, I uh, woke up in the morning and I saw a photo on Facebook. And I had a very strong reaction to this photo. I immediately closed down my laptop, shoved it to the side, and got up and walked away. Um, and it was, I was impacted in what I considered a very negative way. But I just didn't feel I could deal with it at that time. So I tried to shove it aside, and I found, you know, throughout my day, I was just more on edge. Uh, I was very easily frustrated, very easily set off. Uh, and my day was kind of covered with a lot of kind of vague and general sadness, uh, just kind of a cloud over the day. Uh, and I did kind of have the insight that it was connected with this photo, um, and my response to it. So I decided later in the day um, I was going to set aside um, about 15 minutes in the afternoon and just stare at the photo uh, and see what comes up. Uh, the background of the photo was um, uh, some time ago I was living with a girlfriend in a foreign country. Um, without going into too much detail, um, she ended the relationship uh, abruptly and so I was forced to not only move out of our house that we were sharing, uh, but I had to leave the country as well because my immigration status was tied uh, to our relationship. So I was uh, forced to leave and come back to the States um, where I uh, didn't have a home 
uh, and also was faced with having to find uh, a new job. Uh, so those stresses on top of uh, a breakup uh, all turned into a very significant stressful moment, uh, a lot of life change happening very fast. Um, the photo that I'd come across was of several of my friends from that country um, having dinner in my old house. And when I sat and looked at the photo, a lot of things came up. And of course, first it was those overwhelming feelings that made me want to push the photo aside. Uh, there was anger. Uh, I felt very angry that the situation um, had ended. I wasn't ready. Uh, angry at the immigration situation. Uh, angry at my lack of control. Uh, I also felt a sense of betrayal. Um, the friends in the photo had known my girlfriend longer, um, and when the breakup happened, uh, I very quickly lost touch with them because <clears throat> I had moved out of town and they were still living with her. Their lives moved on. Uh, it was very difficult for me. Um, <clears throat> but as I sat and looked at the photo longer, I started to realize that I was feeling those things because it was a very important time in my life. And I started to remember some of the things that I did with those friends and with my girlfriend. I started to laugh. And I started to uh, remember some of the things that we got into, the, the parties and um, just the good chats. Uh, and I started to remember how much I enjoyed being there. Uh, as I kind of went even further staring at the photo, I actually got into instances where uh, I was experiencing remembering the times that those friends stressed me out, where our company just became too much. Uh, they irritated me. We argued over politics. Uh, and that made me laugh as well because it helped kind of take the situation down off the pedestal a little bit. And so as the kind of time of me looking at that photo kind of came to an end, I still had those negative feelings that I had felt in the morning. But I also had a sense of gratitude and a sense of thankfulness that I was able to experience that experience uh, and uh, thankful that I was able to um, get to know those people. Uh, so what happened is even though those negative feelings were still there, I now became uh, aware of a much richer experience. And I could see happiness and I could see gratitude. Uh, and with that, a new set of actions opened up to me. Um, actions rooted in that thankfulness and gratitude. Uh, I had the, the, the thought and the impulse to write to those friends uh, and tell them that I miss them and tell them that I appreciated knowing them. Um, and, uh, you know, even, even without taking that action, I was able to get up and have more peace in, in knowing uh, and seeing that thankfulness of how lucky I was to have experienced, um, you know, I got to live in a foreign country um, and meet these wonderful people. Uh, so the process of, uh, as is sometimes called the meditation circle, leaning into our thoughts and emotions, allowing ourselves to experience them, uh, can actually lead to a greater sense of peace in our lives. Uh, so I want to try a little mindfulness meditation practice with you guys. Um, and... Uh, I'm, I'll discuss in just a second just the posture that I like, but, uh, you know, if you're experiencing any, um, sometimes in my work here at Gilda's Club Nashville, uh, some of the people, some of my friends here, um, they have uh, physical, uh, chronic, uh, chronic pain. So if you're experiencing any discomfort and this posture isn't um, something that's comfortable for you, the aim here is really just to try and find a posture where we feel comfortable but we're not as inclined to fall asleep. Uh, if you do fall asleep, that's fine. You probably needed a nap. Wake up and listen to this webinar later and try it again. <laughs> uh, but I like to um, sit with both feet on, on the floor. And I, I like to imagine that there's a string coming from the crown of my head, and it's kind of being pulled up. But I'm in a, a very straight posture, a very upright posture, but one that's still comfortable. And then as you kind of move into that 
posture, just going ahead and doing this now. Uh, I'll also maybe just rest my hands in my lap. Um, I personally like to interlock my fingers and just uh, rest my hands gently in my lap. And then either with my eyes closed or uh, just focused at a spot just in front of my feet on the floor, just begin to take a couple of conscious, deeper breaths, just as it's comfortable to you. And just with the aim of finding the breath in our body. Our breath in mindfulness meditation is going to be our anchor and our anchor into the present moment. And so look for the sensation of your abdomen moving in and out. Or if it's possible, maybe you can feel the air as it moves across your upper lip, just as the breath moves in and out. And as we start to find a portion of the breath to focus on, just now letting our our body find its own natural breathing rhythm. And as we do that, starting to bring our awareness to the sounds around us. Just noticing our breath in the space. You may hear the sound of the air conditioning unit, fan buzzing. You may hear traffic outside. Just noticing those sounds and allowing them to be there. Noticing your breath as it moves with those sounds. They arise and they pass. And as you become aware of your your breath and the space and the sounds around you, starting to take your attention inward, just noticing the breath as it moves in your body. Noticing the sensation of your feet as they touch the floor. And noticing the feel of our legs on the chair. And if you notice any sensations in your body, sensations that we might normally label as pain or discomfort, I encourage you to maybe try looking at those as just sensations. Just see if you can notice them as just sensations for now allowing those to be there as well. You may try allowing some tension to release on the exhale of your breath. But just noticing the body and allowing it to be as it is. And noticing our breath as it moves throughout the body and being aware of our body and our breath as it is in the space. And as we start to find a sense of stillness, we're going to start moving into just a, a few minutes of silent meditation. And in this time, you may find that thoughts and feelings physical sensations or sounds outside may come up and distract you from focusing on your breath. And some of those you may find they're very easy to let go of. Times when you think about the grocery list or something you're going to do tomorrow, you may find that it's very easy to let go of that and return to focusing on just the breath as it moves in and out. But if any of the stressful thoughts or feelings that circle in your life or any sounds outside or pain that you're feeling, if anything comes and you find that it's difficult to return your attention exclusively to the breath, 
Just spend some time with those thoughts, feelings, sensations. Allow those to become the focus of your practice. And just observe them as they are. Just allow them to move and unpack themselves on their own, free from judging them as good or bad, free from trying to come up with a solution, just allowing them to be there. If you can, watch your breath as it moves along with the thoughts and the feelings. And you may find in the course of time, we're only spending a short time here, but in the course of your meditation practice, focusing on a stressful feeling, you may find that it eventually becomes uncompelling on its own. You may find that your mind has wandered on to something like a conversation you had earlier today. And at that time, if you find that it's easier to return your attention to your breath, Just allow yourself to return to the breath at that time. We may find that we're distracted several times in the meditation practice. But just know that that's part of the practice. And as it's available to us, just returning our attention to the breath. We'll do this in silence for just a couple of minutes. And then I'll ask us to slowly open our eyes when we're done. Now, if you want to slowly open your eyes. And if we were in my class here at Gilda's Club Nashville, I would ask a few questions of um, how was the experience for you? Um, How did you experience the passage of time? Uh, Did it feel long, short? Um, Questions like that. This is, of course, a different kind of interaction, so hopefully um, if you have questions, you can ask them. Um, And hopefully this is something that's useful to you. Um, I usually encourage people to make this, you know, as has already been discussed by by us this evening, um, you know, making uh, something like mindfulness um, a regular practice, um, a daily practice, um, and I, I normally suggest um, just working it in as you can, um, 10, 15, 20 minutes, um, even five if that's what you're um, able to do. Uh, I usually say it's, it's, it's important to um, 
find a time that is easy for you to work into your schedule to start with um, so that you can start to kind of get into the habit and start to feel the benefits of regular practice. Uh, and just as you do that, you can increase the time um, uh, from there. So uh, I hope this was helpful. Um, uh, please ask us questions. Uh, we're all still sitting here huddled around one phone. Uh, so yes, if you have any questions, uh, please chime in. Great. Thank you, Dawson. Um, just want to say thank you again to Dawson for walking us through that mindful meditation. Um, and thank you also to Robert for being open with us and sharing your experience of coping. And then also thank you to Felice for sharing information with us on uncertainty, stress, and distress, and for providing some valuable tips and tools to help manage and also when to seek help. So at this point in the presentation, I want to open it up to the audience uh, for the Q&A session. So if you have a question for our speakers, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A box, again, to the right of your screen. I will give a couple of seconds for you to submit some questions. Okay, so Felice, we have a question for you. Um, one of the big issues I've heard is scanxiety. It's difficult to concentrate and even sleep before a scan, up to the point of even getting the scan results. What strategies do you suggest we try in order to handle this time of extreme anxiety? So that's a great question, and yeah, the fact that they've even coined a term just indicates how common that is. Scanxiety is something that we talk about in support groups um, an awful lot. So, you know, I think there are several of those techniques that can really be employed that we discussed, um, whether it's, you know, a worry box or it's employing some mindful meditation or exercise, movement, or distraction. Um, I think it's also really helpful to talk to somebody about how freaked out you are um, and you know, they don't. You, it's okay to say to someone, "I need you to listen, so that I can simply share with you my anxiety and not carry it alone." Um, and don't judge me, but simply listen. Um, I think it's really helpful that we communicate very clearly to the people around us who love us, that want to be helpful, but sometimes they need direction. So occasionally it can be really helpful to say, I'm not looking for you to fix this. I am just looking for you to open your arms and let me find my nook and hold me and hug me for a while. Let me cry. Let me fret. Um, but don't let me do it alone. And so that can be very compelling if you have someone in your life that you can do that with. Um, I think... You know, that distraction of putting on a movie, watching some, you know, marathon of of House of Cards or whatever happens to be your your distraction. Um, you know, that skin, skin anxiety is usually pretty time limited. So you also can talk to your healthcare team about how important it is for you to get results as quickly as possible because it it, in my experience, is not so much preparing for the scan that's so challenging, but it's that limbo between scan and results. And um, every practice seems to do that differently. There are some people that get scans and results same day, and there are some people that get scans and don't have an appointment for another week or you schedule your scan on a Friday, which means you got to knuckle through the entire weekend. So it's okay to ask for what you need. It's okay to let your healthcare team know that what you need is you are willing to show up at 6 a.m. to get a scan as long as you go home that evening 
with results. If that is something that makes your day, giving up one day, a little bit more tolerable. Great, thank you. We have another question here for you, Felice. It says, it seems like I latch out to my caregiver, but don't mean to. Any suggestions on how to control the lashing out to the ones we love? Boy, yeah, that's, you know, it's 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 always those folks who are safest, typically, that we, um, when our bucket is full, it sloshes out sideways and can come out as being irritable and um, short-tempered. And um, that's not uncommon. I, I guess, you know, trying to work on some of these techniques to alleviate that if you start to sense that it's happening can be helpful. I think finding an outside person or persons to talk to um, as you find that you're kind of your insides are, are tensing up um, in hopes of being a less a little less short tempered. I think talking to your partner or spouse or loved one um, when you're in a less irritable moment to just apologize in advance for what you know might be ugly behavior coming around the bend um, and naming it as this is my anxiety just coming out sideways and um, making a list of all the things you are grateful to and about that person. Um, for them to have kind of an emotional first aid kit to rely upon in those moments of kind of quote unquote attack can be very helpful. And then I think t considering meeting with a couple's therapist um, to help you guys learn some new communication strategies, um, both in good times and difficult times, you know, who can't benefit from from that kind of interaction and education. So I would recommend that as well. Thank you. Our next question is for Dawson. Dawson, it says, I know you said to meditate when you have the time, but is there a better time of day to do it, like the morning? Um, you know, I, I usually like to recommend that people experiment with that a little bit. Um, you know, it, it can be helpful to, like, pick a time when you're just starting and just commit to it uh, and see how it fits. Just, you know, maybe start in the morning um, and say, I'm going to try this every morning when I wake up and see how it works. Uh, maybe the next week you try it in the afternoon. Um, some people will stick to the same schedule uh, for years. Uh, for me, uh, my schedule fluctuates a lot, so sometimes um, uh, it'll be a few months I'll be meditating in the mornings, uh, and then my schedule will change and it'll be 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, so I guess that's a long way of saying, um, uh, you know, feel free to experiment. Um, it's your your practice, um, and uh, uh, I think it's, you know, um, part of the exploration um, is, is trying to find what time works best for you. Great. Thank you. Felice, it says here, I'm caring for my 31-year-old son who has stage 4 pancreatic cancer, and I have metastatic breast cancer. I am playing both the caregiver and patient. Any tips on how I can cope? Wow. Um, that's a lot. I think, you know, what in my, excuse me, in my experience, um, one of the most powerful coping tools, if you've got it available to you, is a support group. And you're wearing two different hats. So you are, an, you know, loving an adult child, with advanced disease and you are living with advanced disease as well. And so if you were to walk through our red door at Gilda's Club Nashville, I might encourage you into a cancer support group for yourself and one of our friends and family or we actually have a group called When Your Adult Child Has Cancer because there are such unique issues in that circumstance. 
So being with other people who are experiencing similar issues, challenges, and stressors is oftentimes, at least in my experience, one of the very best things that you can do to not feel so alone in all of this, to have that community around you to guide you and share wisdom and show up when things are good and show up when things are hard, which unfortunately there are plenty of people in the kind of quote-unquote healthy world that um, maybe fade away during moments of crisis like this. So making sure you're surrounding yourself with people who won't, you know, won't back off, will actually lean in because they understand the challenges because they live them can be very compelling. And I would also encourage, again, you know, considering some individual support, some individual psychotherapy where for a 55-minute hour you get some dedicated time to just unload tease through and learn some some coping mechanisms to put in place. So any of the combination of the above I think might be helpful. Thank you, Felice. We also have a question here for you as well. It says sometimes it is difficult to know what to answer when people ask how I'm doing. This isn't a problem for people close to me, but for those who are friends who are less close. Usually, I simply answer that I am fine, but sometimes that feels like a lie. Any ideas? It's a great question. First of all, the fact that you have people in your world who are showing up to check in on you is really wonderful. Um, I hear an awful lot about folks who have really lost relationships during this process. Um, I'm sure for a host of reasons, either people are afraid they're going to say the wrong thing, so they choose to say nothing, or they are, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. They're just afraid of the whole situation, so they don't get near it, or it triggers something in their past. For a whole host of hopefully well-intended reasons, a lot of times relationships change and people disappear. So I love that people are asking you. Um, I think there's not a blanket answer. You know, I think, I think what I, one of, first of all, you have to decide what do you want to share? What are you comfortable in that moment sharing? And it's really, a, and, and what is the consequence of that? If you share with somebody that you're having a hard day and they lose it, does that mean you're then expending all of your energy taking care of them? And does that meet your need? If they're a person who, if you're honest with them and say, you know what, today is a hard day, if they will show up and say, tell me more or what can I do, then absolutely share that. So it's it's so much of a unique situation and very unique in terms of relationships and just what mood you happen to be in. But I think it's helpful for people to, if you're in the mood, to educate folks, especially when living with metastatic illness. There are a lot of people that make the assumption that if you have hair, well, with any cancer, if you have hair, you must be fine. Or if chemo is quote unquote over, you must be well. And living with metastatic disease is a whole different ball game and is very misunderstood. And so if you can say to folks, you know, today is a good day, or I've had a good scan, but I'm concerned about the next one, or I'm anxious because I've got a scan coming up and that will determine what happens next, or I'm having a good hour, but that means I'll be on the couch two hours from now. You know, there are a million different ways for you to answer that question, and again, it comes back to what you're comfortable in sharing. Thank you. So we have uh, very quickly time for one last question. Felice, what are your recommendations for talking to a 14-year-old child about her daddy having metastatic pancreatic cancer? Her mother is not in the picture. Well, that could be a whole webinar in and of itself, actually. I mean, how to talk to children about cancer 
how to talk to children about metastatic cancer, how to talk to children or teens about end-of-life issues. That's um, that's a huge, huge topic. I, I'd say there's some pretty good basics in my experience. One is, um, you know, speaking in a language that they'll understand. Another is telling the truth. Um, another is making sure you know what it is that they're asking so that you're only answering the questions that they're asking. I'll tell you the very best resource in my opinion, so if you're the one asking this question, I would encourage you to grab a pen. The, the very best book that I have seen addressing this issue is called When a Parent Has Cancer, A Guide to Caring for Your Children. And it's written by Dr. Wendy Harpham, H-A-R-P-H-A-M. Dr. Harpham is a four-time lymphoma survivor and an MD. And she has written what I consider really the gospel about how to talk to children whose families are impacted by cancer. And it breaks it down in terms of not only chronologic age, but maturity level. And she gives some scripts to consider some words to consider using and not using. And in the back of the book is a second book, which is written by one of her children, um, who is maybe she was six or seven when she wrote this um, book that's on the inside back cover called Becky and the Worry Cup. So for little ones, it's a wonderful tool as well. So again, it's when a parent has cancer, a Guide to Caring for Your Children by Dr. Wendy Harpham, H-A-R-P-H-A-M, and it takes you all through childhood and teen years um, with some great do's and don'ts in terms of communication and suggestions. Wonderful. Thank you. So I would just like to say thank you to our participants for your enthusiasm and questions that have made today's webinar a great success. If you'd like some more information, please feel free to visit any one of these resources listed on the screen or visit the CSC website or call our toll-free helpline, which again is 1-888-793-9355. We'd like to thank our wonderful speakers, Felice, Robert, and Dawson, for contributing their time and sharing this valuable information with us. And we'd also like to thank our program supporters, Bristol Myers Squibb and Merck. You'll now be redirected to our post-webinar survey. We greatly appreciate any feedback that you have. Have a great rest of your evening.